Now, we've gotten well over 100 questions, and we have about 30 minutes on our hand right now. So I will do my best to talk like the microman machine and get through each and every one of them. No, I'm just kidding, actually. What I'm going to do is I picked out the ones I thought would be most beneficial for the benefit of the group, and we'll start right now. So first question, okay, and this won't be necessary to any particular individual. I'd love for each and every one of you guys to chime in, and the only ground rules are that um, we don't talk over each other and that everyone try to keep it short so that we can get through all the questions. Sound fair? Okay. First question, is there a diet recommended in patients for Parkinson's disease? Um, so as, as far as diet goes, uh, there are some important principles to keep in mind. Um, so your diet can obviously influence constipation, so it's important to have plenty of fiber in your diet. Uh, the amount of fluids that you drink also influences constipation and can affect your energy levels. Uh, people with Parkinson's are also prone to developing low blood pressure, um, so it's important to have fluids in your diet. Uh, there's a number of diets out there that are healthy for your heart, and the evidence to date suggests that heart-healthy diets like the Mediterranean diet are also healthy for your brain and may help uh, prevent or at least slow the progression of cognitive problems or dementia. Uh, but there is no specific evidence for any particular diet for Parkinson's. Uh, the last thing to mention with that is that high protein diets may be particularly dangerous for people who are sensitive to the effects of protein because protein can interact and actually delay the absorption of levodopa. So now I'm going to ask the big elephant in the room is what about cannabis therapy? I know you mentioned a couple minutes about what that looked like for your talk, but you're from Colorado. Come on, what do right. you tell your patients? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so with regards to cannabis, um, and, and we can I actually gave two talks on this at the World Parkinson Congress, so this could take a bit of time. Uh, so I think the important points to know about cannabis is that there are a lot of different psychoactive chemicals in the cannabis plant, uh, over 60. Uh, the two most commonly known are THC and cannabidiol, or CBD. Um, the evidence from animal models is really mixed, and this surprises a lot of people, but if you stimulate cannabinoid receptors in the brain, so your brain actually has receptors that respond to cannabinoids, uh, you decrease dopamine. Um, so the idea that cannabis is going to become a replacement for dopamine uh, it just does not go with evidence. And if you think about it, I don't know if anyone here has ever inhaled, but that people who smoke cannabis move slower and do less. Um, so it wouldn't stand to reason that that would be a great Parkinson treatment. Um, there are some case control studies uh, that suggest that it may be helpful for uh, sleep, and there have been a few studies of REM behavior disorder. Uh, there have been a few studies of agitation uh, for people with Lewy body dementia, and those have been using cannabidiol-based products, or CBD, which is the non-psychoactive part of cannabis and may be more helpful for sleep and pain. The other thing which I've used quite a bit in Colorado is cannabidiol-based creams and ointments for people's pain, which can provide some fairly good relief without a lot of systemic side effects. Okay, thank you. So this uh, question is near and dear to my heart, actually. It says, I take six ounces of wine every day. Is this okay? okay. Keep going. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm the fast guy on Jeopardy. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so with, with wine, um, it, it's, it's helpful, and there's actually a lot of evidence, I don't know if people have read, that a glass of red wine may be helpful for your um, heart health and cardiovascular health and also your cerebrovascular health. Um, with alcohol, it's a U-shaped curve, so it seems that people who don't drink at all may be at slightly higher risk for bad outcomes, although there's other things that may confound that. Um, so I'm not recommending that you necessarily start drinking if you don't. And obviously, if you get higher than two or three or four glasses of wine a day, then you start having adverse health effects. Um, with MAO inhibitors, so medications like selegiline and risagiline, you may read about a potential interaction with red wine, but that's really more of a theoretical interaction than a real interaction. So if you're having one glass of red wine, that's okay. The one thing also to be wary of is that people with Parkinson's may be more sensitive 
uh, to the dizziness, balance, and cognitive effects of alcohol. And so you just want to be careful when you're using alcohol, but if you enjoy uh, a glass of red wine at night and it doesn't seem to make you more prone to falling or confused, then go ahead and keep doing that. That is great news for us in Northern California. Yeah. Great news. Thank you. And I'm going to buzz in really fast on mm -hmm. this with the, the Jeopardy answer. Is what is memory and cognitive problems? <laughs> <laughs> because we want to think about that when we're, we're looking at medicinal marijuana, regular marijuana, or too much alcohol. If you're already having some changes in your attention, your concentration, and your memory, it might be a good idea then to think about uh, the types of substances that could then make things worse as you're deciding, you know, lifestyle choices. Well, thank you. Okay, so next question is really for all three of you, and I want you all three to chime in, is that Parkinson's is a designer disease, but what are the symptoms that are common to all patients? I think there is a, um, a degree of change in working memory and executive function and in processing speed that occurs at least in, in every patient that I have ever seen. And it may be very subtle. Um, you may be talking about a person who started you know, in the superior range and is now in the high average range. Um, but, it, but it is there and I think that the majority of my patients complain to me at least that they don't feel quite as fast on their feet as they once did. So from the physical therapy side, I think one of our biggest uh, surprises to patients is even patients doing really well is that their balance is impacted. Um, even early in the disease process, they might think, you know, I'm doing great. And yet when they meet with the therapist and they're tested, they do find out that they may have some deficiencies. And the second piece I would say would be the movement quality. Um, as a physical therapist, we're going to notice, oh, wow, you really don't swing that arm, which is going to therefore affect the balance as well. So I think the quality of movement and balance are probably the two things that we see consistently. Um, so as someone who wants to pander to the crowd, I think all people with Parkinson's are really, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, one of the things that I actually always emphasize when I see people with Parkinson's, whether it's the first visit or whether I'm seeing them in the palliative care clinic, is, is uh, variability. Um, and when people come to sessions like this and they see all of these hundreds of symptoms that they could possibly get, a lot of times people have this mindset of, I haven't got that one yet, I haven't got that one yet. And, and I'd just like to emphasize kind of the, the opposite, of, um, which is that nobody gets all of the symptoms of Parkinson's. And just because you've seen something on the screen today does not mean that you are going to get it. Okay. Here, here. Yeah, amen. There were a lot of questions about anxiety and apathy in Parkinson's. And I kind of want to know what your guys' take is on that and how to actually address it and potentially treat it. So apathy and anxiety tend to be, um, a very, I think anxiety even maybe more than apathy tend to be, uh, it tends to be an early feature of Parkinson's disease, possibly in a reaction to the disease itself or possibly because of changes that are occurring um, with the disease onset. I have found that many behavioral techniques work very well for individuals with Parkinson's disease. Um, some of the uh, alternative medicine that are less BS would include things like um, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, really restructuring the way you're viewing the disease, looking more for the positives than the negatives, and I know that's hard to do some days. Um, and then with the apathy, I find that it really does require some support from your care uh, partner to get you going, to get you moving. And routine makes a big difference. So if you can become involved with an exercise program like Silver Sneakers or something like that, that you know, you're coming to a group and the group is helping you get there, that seems to help overcome some of that inertia of apathy. For the physical therapist, I think seeing anxiety, we know oftentimes we may encourage a patient to do exactly what we're talking about is get into a group. If it's reasonable, if the anxiety is too great, then starting working with your therapist one-on-one -on -one and really developing a program that you can stick with. Um, and from the apathy side, I think the care partner is very important as well. And it's our job as physical therapists, I think, is to help motivate you and to identify people in your community, whether it's a rock steady coach or a PWR instructor or yoga, to find somewhere you can connect. 
I think we would all say, many of the therapists, and I'm sure the physicians as well, when we see someone who's doing really successful, their apathy and anxiety are better controlled when they're involved in some sort of group and feel connected. I think uh, Davis Finney put it really well as finding your Peloton uh, and, and keeping active. Yeah, I would agree with that. everything else uh, that was said about apathy and anxiety. Um, I think with a lot of these symptoms, what we sometimes term invisible symptoms, other thing to, to keep in mind is that you need to let other people know about it. Um, so for instance, in the case of social anxiety, a lot of times people will say, well, I just don't want to be around people because I'm embarrassed about my tremor. Uh, but being around other people is so important with a disease like Parkinson's that you really don't want to restrict your social network. So I would encourage uh, people with anxiety or apathy to talk to their physicians about it. In addition to the non-medical treatments, uh, there also can be a role for medications, and there are some very good antidepressants and other types of medications that can really help with anxiety. And it's pretty amazing when people have anxiety and have it treated how much more they're able to do. Um, so it's definitely something worth exploring. Are there other types of forced exercise other than bicycling? I mean, no offense, Davis, but there might be, right? Certainly, and, and actually I have had this conversation many times. Patients have certainly seen this study and a lot of people, this was a very well-known study. Uh, so we know there's also been some treadmill trials done for patients with Parkinson's and they've been quite successful. Uh, on a treadmill, certainly I can set a speed for someone and within a reasonable amount keep them going at a pace where they may not choose that pace, but I may set that, a therapist may or some, a trainer at the gym. Um, right now, I think we've heard it probably 50 times today, the word rock steady boxing. Um, so we're all well aware that that is, in a sense, a forced exercise. This is something that people are not accustomed to. It's new to them. And if you uh, have a coach, I'm sure many of you would tell me that they do force you to exercise, um, as does your physical therapist. So I think that concept of pushing people a little harder than they may mm -hmm. is certainly part of the group dynamic as well. And you can imagine that would occur potentially in a Tai Chi group, a yoga group, rock steady boxing. So we, I think we can make many forms of exercise forced. All right, so a couple of very specific non-motor and motor symptoms of what we can do about them. So why is it that medication actually doesn't help our sense of smell? Yeah, so, um, so with sense of smell, this actually gets to, um, I, I think, some of the core things about what we're doing with research and, and, and how we treat Parkinson's disease. Um, so we're actually in a pretty exciting time when it comes to Parkinson's. So uh, for a very long time, all that we had available, all that we had in terms of research were treatments for the symptoms of Parkinson's. So we really didn't have any treatments or cures or preventions for Parkinson's disease. And the loss of sense of smell is due to the loss of neurons um, in the olfactory bulb uh, that are being lost as a result of the pathological process of Parkinson's, so as a result of this accumulation of alpha-synuclein protein. And so none of the medications that we currently have available impact that. Um, interestingly, um, Jay Alberts, I think, has some data, at least anecdotally, that some of the patients in the exercise group have noticed an improvement in their sense of smell. And there's some interesting evidence from animal models of exercise that aerobic exercise in particular may actually promote the growth of stem cells and may promote nerve growth factors. Um, and so actually out of everything that we've talked about today, the best evidence for slowing the progression of Parkinson's is really exercise. Um, and that none of the currently available medical treatments, other than how they influence exercise, help that. And, and the other point to really hammer home with that is that your medications are not helping you as much as they could if you're taking them and then sitting the, on the couch. So your medications are only helping you if you use them as an opportunity to do more. All right, so drooling. I'm gonna give this one to you, Aaron, because um, not that you drool, but you know, <laughs> you might have some knowledge about what the speech therapists do for drooling. Uh, often what we hear our speech therapists talking a lot to our patients about drooling, um, come, first of all, they'll teach some compens compensatory strategies. So they may ask someone to think about a sugar-free mint, something they can keep in their mouth to kind of remind them or be a, a way to pace that swallow uh, to work from the drooling side. Uh, or from the speech side of things, but realistically in physical therapy, we see that drooling may also be a postural issue. You know, maybe because I have the stooped posture, my head is forward, thus my chin is pulled down, so I'm just in a better position to drool. So our speech therapist may work on the timing, and in physical therapy, we are really gonna look at posture, trying to get someone in a better posture to decrease the likelihood that they're in a position for drooling. 
Another question are also on visuospatial issues and people having unfocused vision, convergence insufficiency. How does that impact your guys' practice? How do you guys deal with that? I would imagine you do, at least all three of you. So I see a great deal of change in visual perception um, in individuals who have Parkinson's disease. Um, Oftentimes they start to have more difficulty judging orientation, judging angles, judging depth. And it can play out functionally because an individual then, you know, steps off a curb or bumps into a wall or falls off their chair, but also contributes to some of the visual hallucination, visual misperception um, um, symptoms with Parkinson's disease. I've had folks who've who misperceive objects that are actually present. Um, and so behaviorally, we talk about making sure there's enough light in the room because shadows can sometimes play havoc on a person's visual perception. Um, being careful about mirrors in the bathroom is particularly challenging because if an individual is starting to have some visual misperception, they're looking into a mirror, it's reflecting backwards on them. Sometimes it's difficult to tell, am I looking at something here behind me where is that and I've noticed that patients will sometimes complain about having more of their hallucinations or misperceptions in in bathrooms or areas that have a lot of reflection um, so we talk about that and then obviously if if those visual misperceptions become severe enough then we you know we, we encourage discussion about different medications for that and then as far um, as really severe issues with sight itself, um, we often will recommend through the treatment team uh, evaluation with one of our neuro-ophthalmologists to, to determine if there are some exercises that can be helpful for improving convergence or uh, just strength of the, the visual system. So to piggyback on that from with a lot of the mirror, which is interesting to hear, and, and a lot of times the therapists, we may use the mirror as a way to point out to someone that in fact they aren't swinging their arm maybe quite as much or their hand isn't as open with a particular exercise uh, or posture, kind of getting to see what that looks like. So we sometimes use that as a cue uh, to help us to kind of guide the therapy and, and maybe have it, no pun intended, an eye-opening experience to be able to see that. Um, <laughs> because they may have heard it from their spouse a thousand times, but really being able to see it themselves for the first time is sometimes pretty um, enlightening. Okay. And I'll just uh, quickly add on, in addition to hallucinations, probably the two most common and important things I see is people having difficulties with reading uh, because of convergence or fatiguing with reading, and prisms can really help with that, so you can get that from an optometrist, ophthalmologist, or neuro-ophthalmologist. And the other thing is night driving. Um, so people with Parkinson's disease can have difficulties with what's called contrast sensitivity. So visual acuity is seeing black numbers on a white background. Uh, contrast sensitivity is seeing dark gray numbers on a lighter gray background. And that can be affected in Parkinson's and really contribute to driving safety. Well, thank you. That was actually quite insightful. How do we address pain in Parkinson's? Yeah, so it's, a, it's a, a really good question, and I think there's some kind of mythology uh, that's uh, surrounding this. So a lot of primary care doctors, even a lot of neurologists, feel that pain is not part of Parkinson's disease. Uh, but the evidence shows um, that about 40 to 75 percent of people with Parkinson's have pain. And that pain can result from orthopedic issues. Uh, so a big cause of that, for instance, is frozen shoulder. So if you're not using your full range of motion, those tendons can shorten, and the joint itself can become fixed and painful. It can be as a result of dystonia or muscle contractions. It can be from rigidity. There can be neuropathic type pains, which can be burning or tingling. Uh, there's some rarer pain syndromes in Parkinson's. Um, and I see probably about one or two patients a year who have had surgery for a shoulder incident, uh, but they really have pain because of their Parkinson's and probably didn't need that surgery. Um, so when it comes to pain, it's complex, but the place to start would be to talk to your physician about it and to really make sure that you get the right treatment for the right type of pain. So you don't just take a pain medication for pain, uh, but you try to find out what's underlying it. So if you're developing a frozen shoulder, you don't want to take um, Percocet, you want to take physical therapy. What are the most common misunderstandings couple have about sex and Parkinson's disease? We have to start with the idea that Parkinson's disease changes a relationship in very important ways. And I sometimes find it very important um, for for my couples to refer to marriage therapy, not because there's necessarily you know this horrible rocky 
history, but because now it's time to start talking about and communicating about issues in a, in a way that's different than what maybe the couple has ever tried to do before. Thinking about Parkinson's disease as a chronic disease model that you're going to be managing probably for decades. Um, and, you know, sex is part of that conversation. Uh, it, it's not necessarily something that you're going to be able to discuss, you know, in the five minutes that you might have with your general practitioner or hopefully a little bit longer with your movement disorder specialist. But there are, there are numerous resources for individuals who are starting to feel like communication issues are starting to break down or even physical issues um, are needing some more help. So I often start with a recommendation for at least a mar marriage therapy consult and then we kind of take it from there. Well, thank you very much. I want to give a round of applause to our panelists here.